Hi everyone, this is track five. And today we're presenting Thomas De Pierre with his talk, Do Not Do This at Home. How we build a distributed data store in Elixir. Thomas, the broadcast now belongs to you. So hello everyone. Um, so welcome to Elixir Conference again. Um, um, it, we may be interrupted by my cat during the thing, so I prefer to warn everyone. So I am a distributed software engineer, right? And the great things about being here at Elixiconf is that um, most people are and know they are here. So I don't feel as alone as sometimes. And in, especially at this kind of conference, right? We, most of us write software for a living or at least are close enough to writing software for a living. And whatever we target in type, in term of language, of type, of systems, of application, it trends these days that we don't hit the networks in the way our app work, right? Even just talking to a database tend to be on a different machine, which means that um, we are all distributed software engineer. And when we grow as a distributed software engineer, right, there are a few rules that we get taught. Um, things like do not roll your own crypto, right? That's a classic software engineer lesson. Do not use JWT, JSON Web Token. Use a lib that interacts with it, but don't use it directly. Is another one that we hear a lot lately because there are some subtleties in how you use them. Do not use SSL. You should now use TLS, at least V1. Please use V1.3 if you can. But that's one of these rules. Um, in the Beam world, we have things like do not spawn a process without a supervisor, right? That's another one of this thing. Um, now, this all great rule that we all know pretty well. Um, if you are working on distributed systems, there are a few rules that are pretty important, right? Things like do not implement your own database, right? We, we are going to hear if you go into the Alexa community, please just use Postgres. Or if you really need something different, you can just use Mongo or React or Cockroach or Influx if you need metrics. And there's all the database made by specialists that make sure that your thing works, right? Because it's a pretty tricky and complex field. And even if you really have to, like you need to store some config on a file, right? That's a data store, right? You need to store some information. You maybe need to store some images in a file system, which is also a data store. You need all these things. Please, please, please don't make a distributed one, right? Distributed databases are really hard. They are really complex. Um, and if you have never looked at it, look at some of the, um, well-written blog posts, for example, by um, Kyle Kingsbury at jepsen.io to look at why it is so hard to make a distributed database. Now today, in this talk, I'm going to break these two last rule with you. I'm going to implement a distributed data store in Elixir, or at least walk you through how we did our own. Warning. The action displayed in this talk were performed by so-called experts. Do not try this at home. So, hello everyone. This is the story of we built a distributed data store for iRespects, our product, and how you should probably not try to do this at home. Um, well, this talk is going to go through the same scenarios that I, synopsis I use for most of my talk. I'm going to present what if has a product that is going to be underpinned by the data store we're going to talk about and extract from this product all the goals and constraints we have on our design, right? And then I'm going to try to show you how these constraints enabled us to make this happen despite the fact we should not have tried this at home. And finally, because I am the kind of person that is definitely an expert, I'm going to tell you some of the resources you may use if you need to do this at home, because that may happen. So um, our product, oh, before I forget, 
I will not take questions during this talk. Um, I would be more than happy to answer your question in Slack or in the over track that should be somewhere here in the Zoom. I will be there after the talk. So I will be more than happy to talk about with you here if you have questions. I will not take questions during the at the end of the talk. Okay, so Arispex. Arispex is a SaaS tool that allows you to explore the data produced by your test suite, right? You send us G unit files, which are um, files that are outputted by nearly every test frameworks out there, or at least every test framework has a way to output there. And we take it with all kinds of data about your test and we store it and we allow you to query it at will, right, from our website. So this is basically how the product looks like right now. So you have um, in the middle all the data. On the top, you can do your querying. And that's, that's, a, that's a screenshot for a prototype. It changed a bit since then, but that's a, seems the same kind of idea. You have this way to explore, like query the data in an incremental way, in a live way to get, data, to get feedback really fast. We have added some other things, but mostly, this is a raw data part, and you can also get some analytic computation where you can ask from stuff like, hey, what is the min maximum of this field? What is the minimum? What is the count of uh, field of events that have this field? What are the uh, distinct type of value for this field? And average and few things like that. Okay, so our goal and constraints are displayed here, right? Our goals are that we need to be able to query on the fly, right? So the whole idea of this tool is that you can come in without knowing exactly what you are searching, but you know there is a problem somewhere and you can incrementally explore your data, right? You can come with, okay, I just want to see what was slow in the past few weeks. And then when you discover that, oh, this is the thing that, is this test that was really slow and slowed everything down. And I want to look at this test, how much did it fail? How does it work? Something like that, right? This is exploratory querying. You need to come in, Query the thing and then keep querying pretty fast. Um, we know that we need to accept nearly any G unit out there. And we'll talk about why that could be a problem. Um, we know we need to handle quotas because we are a SaaS tool, right? So our data store, whatever it is, we are going to make you pay per gigabyte or something like that. So we need to be able to handle the quota limits of your account. We need to be able to handle the grouping function we talked about. So you need to do things like count distinct, uh, percent time, like what is the P99 on, on this field to be able to know what are the one person slower request or faster um, test, for example. You need to be able to handle the raw data. Like I, I need to be able to get the wall information if I need it, because that's what enable me to explore what's happening. Um, we are going to key primarily on timestamps. Like you are always going to do a query on a time window, right? We never update an event. So when you did it, when you do a test, you cannot just come in and say, oh, by the way, this data was false or tests run faster. So that's not possible. And we don't need to join between data sets, right? If you have tests for one app and tests for another app, it doesn't really make sense to join them together. That's a lot of interesting goals for our data store. And then we have a constraint. Constraint is that we have a really limited budget. Uh, I respect is a bootstrap company. We don't have a lot of budget. So the data is sparse. What that means is that a lot of events are null nearly all the time, but sometimes they are not. We want the five second return of the query because we want people to be able to query on the flight exploratorily. Um, the data can be AP. Uh, so what that means is that we don't expect all the data to be returned all the time. It's okay if we missed a few uh, because there is so many of them that it's not going to be visible anywhere. You are here to explore not to have precise answer. Um, this is going to be a lot of data, right? We People are going to want to store months and months of things and the G unit and the heavens can be pretty wide. The schema is unstable because at any point in time, they can decide that some information are not interesting or some need to be added, so we're going to change. And our world developer for that is two devs um, part-time during approximately six months, right? And that constrained us pretty hard. And the thing is, when you look at our constraint, our goals here, we could not find any database giving us that. Uh, we did a prototype with Postgres, it worked okay for a prototype. The moment we tried to scale, problems happened. 
um, especially for sparse data, for the best of great. We had a look at a few of the things, but it ended up that we would have to rebuild a whole database on top of the database, which would have been as hard. So we had to build our own data store. Some of the decisions we took to make that easier for us, like to make it possible to do in these constraints and with this goal. Um, so it's going to be distributed that we needed that to be able to deal with the data, uh, but that was also enabled by our constraints. Um, we are going to do a columnar store of flight wide key value events. And I'm going to talk a bit more about that. We're going to use Kafka for most of the storage distribution and um, ingestion, which is going to simplify a lot of our stuff. And the rest is going to be handled with Elixir through um, handwritten distributed code and live view for the front end and for the querying. Now, the first problem we have to deal with is GUnit JSON. I'm going to go pretty fast on this one, but back GUnit is the uh, input data we get in. And GUnit has this, is this XML format for test suite data that is badly specified hierarchical, deep, complex, like it has all the prime of an XML without a great schema. The thing is every test framework out there can handle it because Jenkins use it to extract basic analytics and nearly everyone, every test framework had to deal with Jenkins at some point. So what we do is that our ingestion accept GUnit format and transform it into a flat G, into a, a stream of flat JSON event, one JSON event per test. But this case. And then we send that into Kafka. That's our whole ingestion. That's how we take data in. Pretty simple, pretty easy. Works really great because we never have to update anything. So we don't have to deal with update. We can just ingest and put in. So that's pretty easy to do. Um, and Kafka is the next bit that allowed us to do all of that because we mostly use Kafka for two things here. Right, And that works because we don't have to do joins and we don't have to do updates. So we can just get a stream of events in and we will, it will never change, right? So we have an append only log of events and that's really easy, there isn't any logic. It just events to write to disk. That simplified a lot of our stuff and that's why we can use Kafka as much as we do. So first we use Kafka as the writer head log and basically it's a log of all the events we took in, right? And then the storage part of the of the system, it's just going to read the events in the topic they got assigned. Um, the great thing also with doing it that way is that at least to go fast and have something that works fast, we can keep all the events in your code quota in Kafka, which means that if a storage node die or if we need to bring a new storage node, we can just replace the whole stream of events in Kafka, right? That's a classic event driven thing. And we can just replay it and it just work, right? We do have a checkpoint in on backup mechanism with the idea that um, the events are not forced to live in Kafka forever because in theory, we, we back up things into S3, we back up a, a checkpoint, but that's an optimization. You don't need it in theory. And so that's really great. That enables us to go pretty fast and that's due to our no join, no update, write only, uh, no update, right? It's a write event log. The other thing we use with Kafka is that it solves our problem. Because if you use a distributed data store, you know that one of the problem with it is that you need to decide where the data goes, right? Where do you, which nodes store which part of the data in a way that you, know, you are not going to get, like in our case, we have a copy, we have two copy of the data. So we have two nodes holding your data all the time. So that if one dies, we have another one, right? And so we can also distribute the query through this node. The problem is that you need to decide which node or what, and specifying which node or what is a complex problem in a distributed system. It's pretty hard. It's a consistency problem. It's a problem of losing data. That's pretty bad. Um, Kafka gives us a solution here by using consumer groups, which is a way in Kafka to naturally distribute a topic into multiple nodes and give you automatic rebalancing, heartbeat, checking, everything that you would need is already done by Kafka. And that's helped us go a lot. The thing is by default, do not allow to have multiple consumers on the same partition, which is a problem for us because um, we want two copy of the data all the time, right? So we need two of them. 
Um, but that's okay. We use broad and we upstream a bit of some advanced use that allow us to use Kafka Consumer Group Protocol. I'm not going to go into detail on this um, because of time, but basically this allows us to have the exact strategy wanted, which for each partition in Kafka topic, we have two copies distributed over the cluster and Kafka and all the hard work, right? And that means that allowed us to go pretty fast thanks to Broad and the Erlang uh, ecosystem. So thanks to Klarna for having done that work and thanks for them, to them to accepting our contribution. Um, the other part is the columnar store, right? So we store things as columnar data. And that means that when we receive an event, remember these events are a flat JSON object, right? Only one level, no nesting of key values. We explode this event into different columns and we have one file per column. Um, the way this work, I'm going to show you just after in that's great because columnar store are greatly adapted to wide space data. And I'm going to show you why. There exists already columnar file format, but they are all optimized for Hadoop and they did not really meet our need. So we had to invent one. That's basically how it looked like. So we got two types of files. We have for each data set, we have one file, which is the index. And that's an index on a type set. And basically what you have here is a column of index from zero to infinity and always strictly monotonically growing. So it's always going to be the index, the next index is always going to be bigger than the previous one. And then we have the timestamp of the message, right? And the timestamp do not have to be ordered. And what the time was to say is that when we come in with a window of time to query, we can say, okay, so between this timestamp and this timestamp, I can go through my wall file index from top to bottom, say, okay, so is this timestamp in my list? Yes, take the index. Is this one in my list? Yes, take the index. And then I get a list of index that are in my query window. And then I can go to the other columns I'm interested in, and I can go through the same file, through the file, and same thing, I got index value, right? And these index are also strictly monotonic here. So I can just go through my list of index and say, okay, is this index in my list? Yes, take the value. Is this index in my list? No, take the value. Is this index bigger than, is this index my list? No, and it's bigger than my biggest index. So I'm finished here, close, send all the value. That works really well because it means that contrary to most databases that store by rows, right? Where you have a row with and every column has some space that's, um, that means that we do not have to store nil, right? If message is a string messages, keeps messages have no value for index three, like there is none here, you can see, I can just not store it. And that means that I don't have to hold it in memory when I query because I can limit it to only what I want. I don't have to store it to disk. It's really great when you have a lot of null value, which is fast data. Um, it also means that this kind of store allows us to have really great, uh, it's really great for append only if you can keep your index ordered, but that's easy to send to Kafka. And it also means that you can pretty well handle schema changing because you can just create a new file. Easy. Um, Alexia made that really, really easy. Um, I have been read, we, we had to do our own format, but I have been read, I have been write, and binary pattern matching are a godsend for this kind of format. It's a binary, it's a basic binary eight uh, byte align format that basically accepts five different types and it just works pretty easy. Like it's probably, I think the wall total for the wall format and reading and writing is something like one red line of code and it's handled everything. And that supports really easily our queries and that supports the index plus string, integer, float, and booleans, which is basically everything we needed. So that's our storage. Now, how do we query? Um, the distributed query engine is pretty simple. We ask Kafka for which node or which partition because that's what Kafka does. We then select for one for each topic for a data set, which one node of the copies, right? Because we don't want two times the answer. So we select, and then we send the queries to task yield many. If you have not used task yield many, I 
strongly advise you to have a look at it. It's probably going to simplify a lot of your stuff. The documentation is great to explain to you how to use it. And it has, it, this simple thing, task in maybe probably saved me three weeks or months of work on the distributed query engine because it's basically solved a lot of the problem for distributed system. In case of timeout, we can just drop the data because remember, we don't care about returning all the data. We care far more about returning fast. We have five seconds. We need to return as much data as we can this five seconds. A few things to note, uh, time manipulation is a pain and that's not an Excel related. It's just that time is a pain. Um, we have a lot of problems with things like what is a start, what is a stop in a query window? Um, what are milli is, is this time stamp in milliseconds or nanoseconds or seconds? Um, time is still a pain and I don't think that's an Excel problem. Um, versioning your intermediate, so we transform the query into an intermediate representation and that's what we ship to the nodes, right? To be able to handle the thing. The thing is, this is a distributed system, right? So we could change the way our querying works in the middle of it, right? Like next version, I could, have, I could want to add a new, a new way to do things or to fix the way my querying works. But if I do that, when I'm going to deploy, I cannot know if all my nodes are going to have the same version of the software at the same time. So I need to find a way to version my querying language. Um, this is a pain that we don't solve very well right now. This is something where there is not a lot of work that have been put outside, out there by the NXT community. Like I've not been able to find good blog posts about it. I've not been able to find good things even in the Alliance community about it. So versioning your messages to all these kind of things, it's still an open problem in Alexa. Um, and something that um, if you go that way, be fairly aware that this is a problem. Okay. So now, how do you try to do this at home? The first thing I would advise, if you need to build a distributed data store in any language, is that you need to know your constraint, right? Our constraints, the fact that we only needed um, AP data, that the data was sparse, that there was no update, there were no joins, is what allowed us to do that. Right? We could do our querying pretty simple due to our columnar store. We could do our ingestion pretty simple because it works with just a Kafka thing. The constraint is what allow you to do these kind of things in a short time frame with a limited budget, even if everything tells you that it's a really bad idea. The second thing to know is that you need to be pretty, pretty sure that nothing else fits your constraint. So the way to look at this is please um, get this book. Uh, you can find it on dataintensive.net. I'm going to give you the slide at the end. Um, this is a reference book for handling distributed data in your application. It's cover a bunch of things. It basically cover everything we know today about handling distributed data. And that means there's a lot of things you are probably never going to use and that every chapter is pretty shallow on that. But it allows you to know what exists, right? And you cannot know what is going to fit your constraint until you know what exists. So, and every chapter has pages of references to go in depth if you discover that this may be what you need. This is probably, if you need to deal with this with distributed system, this is probably going to help you far more than other things on this list. The other thing is that you are going to have to read the research, right? If you find all these references, you are going to have to go and read the research. And part of that is because there is a wide numbers of research and work done on distributed system that never escape the product it was built for, or rarely. And what that means is that a lot of stuff that you need is not implemented anywhere. For example, in our case, um, the Kafka consumer group protocol was not existed anyway. For our um, analytic queries, for things like count distinct and percentile and histograms and heat maps, there is simply no library in Elixir on Airlines that does it well. Um, some stuff are done. Uh, we were able to find something called count distinct, but all the percentile stuff is something we, have, we are having to implement ourselves. 
It's simply not implemented. It doesn't exist. What that also means is that um, you are going to have to do it by hand, right? You are not going to have a choice. You are going to have to do it yourself. You are going to read the research, to find it, and to implement the research yourself. And that's why you are going to need this book by Fred Ebert. If you're part of the Alexei community, you probably have heard of Fred before. If you have not, go check his website, fred.ca, F-E-R-D.ca, it's great. But this book is the book on property-based testing for Erlang and Alexia. It's a great book by Pak Pog. And the thing is, most of these research papers are not battle-tested. They are not written in a language of code, right? They're not written in Excel, they're not written in Java, they're not written in Go. They are usually written in a mathematical language. They are not that hard to read, usually, because it's pretty simple but they tend to be pretty complex to implement because you discover that there is a lot and lot of small details that no one took care of before. In particular, uh, and that's why property-based testing helps you because property-based testing allows you to make sure that what you implemented from a paper work as expected, even when you begin to optimize it because the way it was described just does not work well with your language of choice. Um, most of these paper come with the explicitly defined invariants and property to respect, and this makes sure that they work. So they're pretty easy to use property-based testing. The last result I'm going to advise is more specific. If you want to know more about our colonel store and the way our query engine work, you can go to the second talks in there, the YouTube link in there, which is um, why we built our own distributed column store from um, which is from people at Honeycomb because he built something that looks a lot like our stuff. Basically, I respect it in a lot of ways, a copy of the Honeycomb system. And um, you can go to the first talk on Kafka about the Kafka group, consumer group protocol, because as far as I know, this is the only place where it's documented how it works. The official documentation doesn't talk about that. The don't talk a lot about that. The Kafka documentation doesn't talk about that. The client side doesn't talk about that. That's this talk by one of the tech lead of Kafka. It's probably the only place where we can learn about it. And as far as I know, nearly no one except us and Confluent use it, which please use it more because that means it will survive better and have more people battle testing it. Um, thank you for your time. My name is Thomas Pierre. I'm the CEO and tech lead of Arispex, and I will be in the old way track if you have any questions. Thank you very much. I need to stop sharing.